Okay, everyone, it looks like we have about maybe half of our registered participants. So I just want to go ahead and get started because we want to be mindful of the time of everyone. Just want to say welcome and good evening. I'm Felicia Bland. I'm the membership development specialist for Girl Scouts for Kentucky Anna, the Cable and Service Center, which is located here in Bowling Green. And I want to welcome you tonight to Girl Scouts of Kentucky Anna's Zoom presentation of Troop 6000 with author Nikita Stewart. Uh, we are very honored to have the Sorors of Alpha Kappa Alpha Incorporated Omicron Sigma Omega Chapter as our co-host tonight. And uh, I want to thank everyone for their attendance. And I see uh, that we have a very diverse, diverse group of volunteers and staff from several of our sister councils, as well as community leaders. And I do believe we have some Girl Scouts in the house tonight, too. So I want to thank you for coming on the call as well. I um, just want to remind you of a few housekeeping rules. Um, we're asking that you remain on mute and that you utilize the chat box if you have any questions. Um, and please just be respectful at all times in the chat. And I'm no sure that we're going to have a wonderful evening. So at this time, I would like to introduce our moderators for the evening, which is Ms. Courtney Gent. She's the outreach specialist from Girl Scouts of Kentuckyana and Ms. Tamara Glass who is the president of Alpha Kappa Alpha. Thank you, ladies, for uh, keeping us in order tonight. Uh, so I will now turn the program over to Ms. Courtney, and she will continue with our agenda. OK, so as um, Ms. Felicia said, just we're going to, if you have any questions, there will be a Q&A following um, Nikita's um, introduction and overview of the book. So if you come up with any questions, you can go ahead and submit them and we'll bring them up during the Q&A portion. And now I'm going to hand it over to Miss Misty, who is also a part of our recruitment team for Girl Scouts of Kentucky, Anna. Hi there, that's me. My name is Misty Elliott and I am the membership development specialist for the Heartland region of uh, the Girl Scouts of Kentucky and a council. And I have the very honored privilege today of introducing our guest of honor. Um, we are beyond blessed uh, that Miss Nikita Stewart could take the time uh, to share with us today. And I want to call out uh, very specifically the uh, uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha um, members that are present as well as anyone else from our cave land and specifically our Bowling Green area. And as I tell you a little more about Miss Nikita, you'll, you'll understand why there's a, a significance there with that particular time. But we are uh, very fortunate that she could take the time with us today. Uh, Miss Nikita Stewart is a native of Bowling Green and a graduate of Warren Central High School. So um, we, I'm sure have some local folks who are going to uh, burst with pride just hearing that. Um, she's also a graduate of Western Kentucky University. And I would say about half the human beings that I know um, who have gone on to do amazing things came out of Western Kentucky University. So um, she is definitely amongst them. Um, at WKU, she majored in journalism and her first job out of college was at our very familiar, especially for those folks coming out of the metro area, a uh, very familiar local courier journal. Um, Nikita is now a reporter covering social services for the New York Times. So she's gone all the way from Louisville, Kentucky, um, all the way up the ranks to uh, the tippy top of prestige in journalism. Uh, the News Women's Club of New York recognized uh, Miss Stewart in 2018 for her coverage of homelessness, mental health, and poverty. So um, that definitely gives her a, a very unique perspective uh, in order to write such an incredible book. Um, and for those of you who haven't had a chance to grab it, it is available and absolutely incredible and a quick read. She was also a contributor to the Landmark 1619 Project in 2019 and she has been a finalist for the Livingston Award and an Investigative Reporters and Editors Award. She joined the New York Times in 2014 after 
after working at the almost equally as prestigious Washington Post. So we are very fortunate to have Ms. Stewart joining us today. And um, I'm so excited to hear everything that she has to share with us about this incredible masterpiece that she has created and shared with all of us. And with that, I hand it back to Courtney. Thank you, Misty, for that awesome introduction. So now we'll go right into it. So now to introduce Miss Nikita Stewart of the author of Troop 6000. Okay, well, thank you all so much for um, the wonderful introduction. And uh, I want to thank um, Felicia Bland for uh, reaching out to me. And, you know, this all started with um, uh, DM on Twitter where she was like, are you the same person like I talked to? If you all don't know, um, you know, uh, Felicia um, has been instrumental in bringing attention to um, the unfortunate, uh, I guess, kind of takeover, not to get political right now, um, of an area where my um, grandmother's um, home was. Um, and so uh, she, I guess, recognized my name for that, for, from that. And then she said, are you the same Nikita Stewart who's written this book about um, a Girl Scout troop? And I'm like, that's me. Um, and so we started talking and I had already talked to Soror Tammy Glass um, also about uh, the book and about putting an event together because um, as much as I love doing all of these events for people all over the world, like, um, you know, the book is being sold overseas. Um, and, you know, I'm on the radio with like somebody in the UK and, you know, I'm talking to like, like I said, people from all over the world, but it's very important to me to um, reach back to the community that uh, brought me up um, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority is very dear to my heart. The people of Bowling Green are very dear to my heart. Um, and now um, I have learned so much more about the Girl Scouts. And I will tell you that there are so, so many similarities between the Girl Scouts and all of these different organizations. Shout out to um, my cousin, um, a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, who is on here today. Um, all of these organizations just help to uplift the community. And, um, you know, when I first started reporting the story, I thought that um, I was going to come away with a book about homelessness. But what I came away with was really a story about community and how people um, have the desire to come together and to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. Um, to give back, like we're talking about people who um, at a time when they had the least, they gave the most of themselves. Um, and so I am just so happy to finally share this story with the masses. Um, it's getting a great response. Uh, people just really um, love the book, which um, is very heartening to me. And, um, you know, I think some people will look at this and they're like, oh, well, you know, it's about the Girl Scouts. And right now we're grappling with um, race and economics. But I will tell you that, um, no, it doesn't um, hit you over the head um, with those topics. But those topics are certainly, um, I, I raise those in the book because, unfortunately, in New York City, most of the people who are homeless are um, black families, um, and in 2016, 2017, when the city was trying to open more shelters, um, there was a lot of pushback, and believe it or not, New York City, as diverse as we are, we do have pockets that are, um, you know, majority of one race or one, ethnic un one ethnicity, and in some of the white neighborhoods, the white neighborhoods did not want um, shelters in their communities. So, um, you know, but uh, the Girl Scouts uh, persevered and uh, here we are. And I wrote a whole book 
And, you know, I wrote my mom an, an inscription. I'm like, Mama, we did it. I wrote a whole book. Um, so it's very exciting. And I am um, looking forward to your questions. Awesome. So that sounds like it opens us up to our Q&A portion. So I will start off with one of our pre-submitted questions. And if anyone here joining us has any questions, please feel free to write them in in the chat box. And Ms. Tamara is going to moderate those questions for us so we keep this nice flow. Um, so let me pull this up. Well, it decided to close itself. Give me one second. <laughs> there they are. Okay. Okay, so our First question will be, so what type of impact do you hope to have on Girl Scout troop members and young ladies and woman, women of the community at large by writing and sharing this book? Um, you know, it certainly is a book for everyone, not just the Girl Scouts, but, um, you know, once I uh, was in the thick of it and recording it and writing it, I realized that um, this book really served um, as a way to remind Girl Scouts what the organization is all about, um, to remind um, people about the diversity of the organization. Uh, you know, when Juliet Gordon Lowe um, started the Girl Scouts so many years ago, more than 100 years ago, um, you know, it certainly did look different. Um, it was very white, but she started out the organization with the idea that it would reach, a cl reach across class. And very quickly, it became evident that it would reach across race and ethnicity. So very early on, we saw troops that embraced um, a, a lot of different girls, um, different communities, and, you know, it grew from there. Um, you know, I certainly believe that the Girl Scouts is one of the most diverse organizations um, that I've ever reported on. Um, and, you know, this is a reminder that the Girl Scouts um, should always try to reach back um, and make sure that they are bringing others up. Uh, also, um, you know, the Girl Scouts um, in the book embody so many of the um, tenants, the Girl Scout promise, um, and I hope that's what um, particularly Girl Scouts um, get from the book. Thank you. Okay, Tamara, if you want to ask a question from the chat box. Yes. I'm sure in your career, you have had an opportunity to write about a lot of different topics. What made you choose a particular topic to write about, to write a book about? Well, you know, um, we kind of have a saying, um, sometimes the subject finds you. And, um, you know, not to get all religious and spiritual on you all, but I really do believe. And I'm like, oh no, I'm not crying tonight. Mm -mm. Uh, but it really was, um, you know, some people would call it serendipity. Some people would call it kind of divine intervention, a divine hand. Huh. But um, I never really wanted to cover social services most of my career. Um, most of my career, I've covered um, uh, politics and political corruption. I've been like heavy duty investigative reporter, you know, people were afraid of me. Um, and uh, so covering social services was very different for me when I was asked. Um, I uh, 
uh, when I started at the New York Times, I started as um, a city hall reporter, basically covering the mayor. Um, and I um, would parachute in for the national desk to some of the big events that occurred around the country. Um, and one of those events was the tragic killing of Freddie Gray in um, Baltimore at the hands of police. Um, and so when I went, um, I ended up writing a story more about his neighborhood and the poverty in his neighborhood. And an editor read that and the Times hadn't had a social services reporter in um, several years. And um, they knew that that was a missing piece. And she, you know, she was like, oh, you were so comfortable like, have you ever considered covering social services? And I was like, no, I'm like, I was too close to it, you know, basically. But, um, you know, I gave it some thought and I realized that it would be something that I could do that was different. I knew that I could bring my perspective to it. Um, and so in late 2015, I started covering social services. Um, and to get started on the beat, when you're a reporter, you go out and you meet lots of different people, you um, have a lot of coffees, you go a lot of places, and um, it's very difficult to get inside shelters because, um, you know, there is a level of privacy, that obviously, the residents deserve. Um, and so I got an invitation to go to a women's shelter for a Thanksgiving lunch in 2015. And I showed up and these Girl Scouts were serving lunch. And I was like, I was very moved that day, very touched, um, just to see the Scouts like serving the dinner. There's something about seeing, you know, little girls in their uniforms and passing out the plates. Um, and so, you know, I took a few notes. Um, I mostly talked to the women um, who were residents of the shelter. And I glanced across the room and I saw Giselle Burgess and her daughters, but never occurred to me, never, that they would ever become homeless. And so fast forward to 2017 and I get an email from the office of the same council member who had invited me to that um, Thanksgiving lunch. And it turned out that this uh, troop leader and her family, who I had, um, you know, just seen in passing um, less than two years earlier, uh, had become homeless. And she had decided to start a troop where she was living. Um, and I wrote a story about them and the story was very popular, it went viral. They became basically famous overnight, at least to um, you know, cable news and network news and blogs and you know, and that, that CNN, The View, um, and uh, so, like, after the story ran, I immediately um, got a lot of um, requests asking, like, oh, are you writing a book? I was like, I guess I'm writing a book. Um, and, you know, I went to uh, Giselle because um, she is the, um, not to give you, like, literary lingo, but she is the protagonist, the main protagonist of the book. And... Uh, you know, it was all going to hinge on her, which she allowed me to follow her for um, a year or more. Um, and I knew that I would also be following other families as, you know, I decided like who would emerge or who would even want to participate in a book. Um, and that's how it started. I sat down with her. Um, if you've read the book, we sat down in the breakfast room where they would have the meetings. And um, she said, absolutely. Um, and she gave me um, a lot of trust uh, that I didn't know until we did one of these talks a few weeks ago that she didn't initially touch uh, trust me. And if you've read the book, um, she said that uh, she and other people really began to trust me after that first camping trip that you read about in the book. 
Um, and, you know, it went from there. Um, I thought the story uh, was going to end like, I was like, okay, they're going to get housing and then the book is going to end there. But um, if you've read the book, you will know that that is not where the story stopped. Um, there are a lot of ups and downs, a lot of twists and turns that, you know, you can't make up. And this is one of those things where um, life truly is uh, more uh, exciting and um, just more, uh, more meaningful than fiction can be. Um, and, uh, you know, there were a lot of people who initially wanted me to like go ahead and have the book like all planned out. And I was lucky enough to have, um, literary agents who I finally selected after there was like a little thing where a lot of people, a lot of agents wanted this book. Um, and the agents I went with were, um, a husband and wife, uh, team who basically said, you know, take all the time you need. And I really reported out the book before I even um, found a publisher for the book. So basically the book was written. It wasn't like, oh, I think I'm gonna come up with this. It was like, this is what happened and this is the story that I want to tell. Okay, so another one of our pre-submitted questions. So you kind of touched on this a little, but what tie or sorry, what was the most rewarding experience for you gathering the information for the book? Oh, um, just the people. Um, you know, there are now people who are going to be in my life for the rest of my life. Um, I can't explain that kind of bond that I made with um, the Girl Scouts and even more so that with their parents because, um, you know, obviously I needed their parents' permission to um, follow them because we are talking about girls who are underage. Um, and uh, so, you know, I still stay in touch with, uh, you know, so many parents. I mean, you know, we're social media friends, so I kind of know what's going on with them day to day. And, um, you know, it's also one of those things where, like, they trust me with their secrets. So, like, you know, there are things that happen after the book that I'll never be able to tell you about. Um, but, um, you know, it's just uh, having I, – I, I love journalism for the people. And in this case, I met some great people. And um, I'm just happy to – they made me a better person. And um, – uh, yeah, I don't even know what else to say. So. Tamara, you're good to ask another one from the chat box. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. I just want to uh, make a, um, a little bit correction on the introduction that um, Felicia so graciously did for me. I am president of Omicron Sigma Mega Chapter. Of, of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. I'm not the president of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Um, we do have over a thousand chapters um, in 55 nations in all 50 states with nearly 300,000 members. So um, with that, I would like to go with the next question. It says, hello, Nikita. Where do we get the book? And does your book address the follow-up and or success stories of the girls that were served in the truth? Yes. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I'll, um, put the link to the book in the chat. Um, the book, um, you know, the thing is, uh, I also had to deal with reality. So unfortunately, some of the girls and their families remain in shelter. I'm glad that more families are out of shelter than in. Um, but, um, you know. That is a uh, reality. Um, but I do like that there is this um, hope. Um, you know, there's this reality that everything doesn't work out for everyone at this time, um, but that the girls um, were exposed to um 
to everything, to politics, to entrepreneurship, to like just understanding that there was a world outside of shelter and a world that um, is outside of um, the poverty that unfortunately they um, were or, or are still now trapped in. Um, I don't want to give away too much of the book, but you'll see um, some really uh, wonderful things happen for uh, several of the girls. Um, so uh, I'll try to put the link in the chat. Awesome. Thank you. Let's see. Another question that was pre-submitted was, what about this story inspired you the most? Huh. Um, you know, like I was saying at the beginning, um, just the fact that people who, um, you know, uh, you're in shelter, um, you should be, I guess, it, no one would fault you if you were only worried about getting housing, making sure you get higher wages, making sure you get your kids to school, making sure you, know, you have money for transportation to get to work. And yet, um, with all of those um, problems, um, they still found uh, uh, the time to commit <laughs> the Girl Scouts. And what's so great is that um, because of um, Girl Scouts and because of Troop 6000, um, a lot of people really found a purpose. Like um, one of the things that I tell uh, a couple of folks who, you know, because everybody has ups and downs, right? So even after the book, now people have ups and downs. And um, I can remember telling someone um, who was down, I was like, and you know what? Um, no one will ever be able to take away that you like help start Troop 6000. Like, I think a, a little, there's a little bit of all of us who like, we wonder like, what will, you know, what will people say at the end of my life, right? Um, and, um, you know, they'll be able uh, to say this. And uh, so, yeah. Are you ready for me to ask another question? On to you. If others wanted to start if others wanted to also start a troop for homeless girls and families, what are a couple of tips you would give them in order to be successful? Well, um, you know, the thing is, um, Troop 6000, um, I strongly believe, would never have happened without buy-in from people who could make it happen. Um, Troop 6000 um, receives 1.1 million or has received 1.1 million dollars from New York City. Um, they use that money to expand um, and keep the operations going for three years. Um, we expect that to be renewed. Um, you know, there are a lot of budgetary issues, but you know, this is definitely a program that has worked and has become very special for the city. Um, but it took, um, you know, a council member who um, had been homeless as a baby, um, a, uh, a person within the Girl Scouts organization in New York City who knew um, the people um, who had had humble, you know, a humble upbringing herself, um, a person who worked at the Department of Homeless Services who also had experienced um, hardship as a child and found comfort in the Girl Scouts when she was a child. Um, and so that's why it's so important for our uh, government leadership uh, to, be, uh, to be diverse and not just um, 
racially and ethnically, but also um, from from um, a perspective of the incomes that we came from and how we grew up. Um, and so I think it's very important for if you're start, trying to start a similar troop, um, you have to make sure that you have the um, volunteers um, because volunteers still remain an issue um, for Troop 6000 um, because you have to have people who um, are not just gonna be there for the fun trips, um, who are going to be there every weekend. Um, and uh, also you have to have the, the funding um, because uh, you have to remember that this is going to be a troop that's not going to be sustained by uh, dues or by cookie sales. Um, cookie sales can be very difficult for um, girls who are experiencing homelessness. And so um, you can't count on that income stream either. And so you really need to make sure that you have secured sponsorship. And lastly, while I'm talking about sponsors and I'm talking about supporters, make sure that they are supporters and that you give the parents of the girls the, you make sure that you are empowering them to be as much a part of the organization. Don't make them feel like you're like kind of um, pushing the Girl Scouts on them. Make them fit, make sure that they too are troop leaders, even if they have to be that co-leader that can't make it to every meeting because they have to work or look for work or look for housing. Um, just make sure that they too are a part of the organization um, because um, the more buy-in they have, the more their children are also going to benefit. Thank you. That was awesome. Let's see. I have a couple more here. So kind of building off of that one, this person asks, have these troops continued to be engaged and active in the shelters within New York City? Yes. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's been, you know, we're in a pandemic. Um, it, I, I've seen, you know, I haven't been anywhere outside of New York City since the pandemic. So I've seen videos and your pictures so I know life is a little different for you but like I walk out of my door with like a gas mask on basically um so life is very different here um but uh the truth um all of the different shelter sites um uh you know one I know one of the shelter sites had already started virtual meetings um and all of the troops regardless of whether you're troop 6000 or um, a traditional troop um, they're going to be starting, well, I guess they started this week, um, virtual meetings. Um, and I attended one and for the Girl Scouts out there and even Soros, um, you know, there, there's a closing um, circle. And so um, to see this be done virtually, everybody held hands like this. It was pretty cool. Um, and um, it was very sweet. Um, and I will tell you, um, before everyone entered, you know, we were like, okay, how do we do this Zoom? Woo um, these kids had the Zoom down pat. They're like in the chat and stuff to the chat. I'm still like trying to figure out. I'm like, okay, let me go and find that link to my book to put in the chat. But like if a Girl Scout had been on here, she would have already put it in the chat. Okay, the next question that I have in the chat, are there other troops in homeless shelters? And if so, how many? And how can we help to support the troops that need our help? Okay, um, so um, in New York, you know, it started with um, eight girls in one shelter. And now, gosh, they've reached between 700 and 1,000 girls um, and uh, women in 20 different shelters. Um, so it definitely has grown. And you have to remember that people are transitional. Obviously, they're not in shelter forever. So, you know, these are different girls transitioning in and out and joining traditional troops after they leave Troop 6000. Um, 
and Troop 6000 has also inspired other troops throughout the country, um, including one right down the road from uh, Bowling Green in Middle Tennessee. They also call themselves Troop 6000. Um, and uh, they have gotten a lot of support. Um, I uh, visited uh, the office um, when I was like working on the book and making sure that, and you'll read about them in the book. Um, and then there are uh, similar troops like in Copper's Cove, Texas, um, in Bergen County, uh, New Jersey. Um, I was at a, um, a conference on um, student homelessness and a guy in the audience, um, he was like, oh, there's one in Hawaii. And I was like, whoa. Um, and so not all of them are calling themselves Troop 6000. Um, uh, the Girl Scouts of Greater New York have, you know, kind of taken ownership of that name. Um, and they'll decide um, how it might expand throughout the national organization. But like I said, many um, uh, councils across the country have um, taken up this uh, mission of making sure that they reach um, homeless girls, especially at a time when so many um, families, unfortunately, more and more families are becoming um, homeless. And um, I, uh, you know, I, I hope for the best, but we also have to be um, mindful and realistic about what this pandemic has done to our economy. And I'm afraid we're going to see um, an increase in the number of families entering homelessness. And I certainly hope um, girls and their families uh, will get to um, have uh, programs, if not Troop 6000, um, programs like Troop 6000. Um, to kind of speak on Girl Scouts of Kentuckyana and how we've kind of done something similar. Um, I'm with Outreach for Girl Scouts and Felicia has been working with Outreach um, within the Bowling Green area. And we've had um, quite a few donors and have been able to produce six troops within the Metro Louisville area. And I believe Felicia has had a couple in the Bowling Green area. Um, we haven't been based completely out of homeless shelters. Um, we've had some community partners, some school partnerships. Um, but so anyone who is in Metro Louisville or Bowling Green, me and Felicia are your gals and we can get you connected to some awesome troops. <laughs> um, but let me see, look through this list. Let's see, I think I've hit all of my pre-submitted questions, so if we just want to stick with the chat box. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, it says, will the recording of this Zoom call be available to share with other troop members that were unable to join this call? I can speak on that as well. So we are recording this call. Um, we are planning to do some editing so we get some more kind of you don't get the part in the beginning where we were just chatting about nothing <laughs> for 30 minutes. You guys weren't in here. Um, but yes, we will have this available on some sort of platform. Okay. And then another question, talk through a normal troop meeting activity trip for the population of Girl Scouts. Just how do they, how do they make it work? Oh, you're asking me um, how like Troop 6000 made it work? Yes. Well, it can be very hard um, because um, you have to get everybody together. Uh, you know, the biggest thing, well, there are a lot of permission slips. A lot of permission slips. I have to do a lot of permission slips myself for the book. Um, but um, even for the field trips, remember that you're dealing with children. Um, and so that takes some coordination. And then coordinating transportation, um, just basically generally keeping up with every child. Um, and uh, what's, uh, I think that the um, Girl Scouts of Greater New York have done um, very well um, is they've really given each site, um, and when I say site, I mean shelter, but we call them sites. Um, they've given each site ownership 
over um, their Troop 6000 so that they're able to plan their activities um, and tailor them to the girls um, in their, at their site. Um, and then they have um, kind of, uh, because people still are, you know, still want to really help to 6,000 and it is New York City so there are a lot of cool things um, that the girls can do so um, you know whether it's uh, going to the Samantha B show and seeing how it works behind the scenes or visiting Jimmy Fallon or um, you know just world thinking day is actually my favorite activity because it brings all the sites together um, in one place um, and, um, you know, it's amazing to see the girls kind of look around like, oh, it's not just like the 20 girls who are at my shelter. Okay, I get it now. It's like all of these different girls. Um, and, you know, they also do like big group trips to, um, um, you know, uh, farms um, during the fall, um, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, it does, it takes a lot of coordination. Okay. And when you work for the New York Times, is it expected that you write a book and do they make it easy? And does the New York Times support journalists who wish to write books? Oh, mm. well, um, well, I will say that I got in just under the wire. Um, no, they are very supportive of, um, journalists pursuing um, books is certainly not mandatory. Um, it's not expected, but um, you know, it is one of kind of those rites of passage for um, a reporter to be able to like take a body of work and expand it into a book. Um, and when I had the opportunity to do it, um, you know, I first went to um, my um, bosses and I explained to them, um, I have this opportunity, I would like to pursue um, writing a book, you know, what does this look like? And, um, you know, they explained to me, you know, this is on your time. Um, we still expect you to do everything that you're supposed to do. I'm like, okay. Um, but uh, then when it came to, so while I was reporting the book, I was still working full time. Um, I, um, luckily, like the meetings were every Friday night. So I basically made sure like I got all my work done and I was basically out of the office by five o'clock every Friday and I went straight to the Girl Scout meeting and then they had their activities, like some activities, um, you know, a few during the week, but a lot of them were on the weekends. Um, and so, you know, for like 18 months, like my weekends were not mine. Um, I have a tendency to uh, have a lot of group vacations with friends. Uh, many of those group vacations, I was like, I'm out, I gotta leave early. Um, and, uh, but you know, it was definitely worth it. And then when it came down to the writing, um, the Times did give me um, some time off. Um, they were very generous about that. Um, it's called a book leave, and uh, you don't get paid. Uh, so, you know, I'm just writing and not making money, uh, <laughs> which is fine. You know, it all worked out in the end. Um, and, uh, you know, so I took the time off to write, and uh, luckily I returned and um, it was fine, and I went right back to my, you know, regular job. Um, you know, when the book came out, the Times has been very supportive, um, and, uh, you know, uh, the editor of the paper, Dean Bacay, you know, sent me a very nice note, like, congratulations, and, you know, I had, you know, champagne and flowers arriving, so, you know, it, people definitely recognize, um, the book and um you know then but they also treat you like anybody else so um you know they put me in book review i had quibbles with the book review but you know i'm like okay 
Um, but, you know, next week, um, well, this coming Sunday, um, I'm editor's choice of the, um, of the New York Times book review. And what I love is that, um, you know, I didn't get any special treatment. So I was very surprised that um, they picked Troop 6000 to really promote this coming Sunday. So, um, you know, I'm heartened that uh, my work stands for me and not just because I'm a New York Times reporter. I mean, I don't even know anyone who works in book review. Okay, and then could you discuss how you were able to manage the many roles or hats of a reporter, outsider, confident friend, and how the roles had to change and where you see yourself now? Oh, okay. Well, that was hard. Um, you know, I had to, you know, constantly explain to people, not constantly, but um, I did um, on several occasions have to explain to people, I am a reporter, um, you know, and a lot of times the girls, especially the younger ones, they thought that I was like a, a a troop leader, <laughs> like, no, not a troop leader, but they knew that I was like always walking around a pad. And you know what, one of the um, most gratifying um, and touching uh, things about uh, covering the story uh, in the, well, in re reporting the book uh, was that some of the girls started showing up to the meetings with notepads <laughs> because they're like, well, I gotta do what Miss Nikita does. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> um, which was just very sweet. And, um, you know, uh, uh, two of the girls have said that, you know, they now want to be journalists, which just, yeah, it's, yeah, they're like, oh, I see what you did. And like, you wrote about my family in a way that, you know, is like, thoughtful and sensitive and so you know that's uh wonderful so but I did have to draw that line and um you know now that the book is over um you know things can be a little looser um but you know they're still like oh when the kid is the one who wrote the book um but uh you know I have you know gone out hung out that kind of thing and um I go to birthday parties and baby showers and all kinds of stuff, um, you know, I show up for, it, so, yeah. Okay, um, this is just a statement. It says, greetings from Mu Delta Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha located in Radcliffe, Kentucky near Fort Knox. I am the former Brownie Troop leader from Alexandria, Virginia and now the and know the benefits of the program. Yes, there are a lot of permission slips for everything, and that is from uh, Sora Terry Owens. Aww. And Sora Barbara Pollock says, kudos, Sora Nikita. I see how rewarding this opportunity has been for you and the impact you have had on these young ladies. And let's see, I got a couple more questions. Nikita, how do you feel going through the process of capturing such a compelling story? Um. You know, I feel, uh, I, you know, I think at the beginning I said not to get all spiritual and religious and I like rarely talk about my beliefs. Um, but, you know, this is one of those things where God was like, you better do this and you better do it right. And, um, you know, I, I feel very pleased that um, I had this kind of impact. Okay. Um, it says, what part of the Girl Scout program seemed the most impactful on the girls, regular meetings, troops, or other different experiences? Um, I would say that they had different, um, different uh, impacts. And so like the regular meetings, uh, you know what the regular meetings mean? It means that someone shows up for them every week. And that's important. Um, the girls, um, who have, um, had so much instability in their, uh, at least in the time that they are, you know, entering shelter, because you have to remember that homelessness, um, can be a process. 
unless it's like a fire or a flood or, you know, some kind of catastrophe. Um, homelessness doesn't happen overnight. So um, these are families who have already maybe moved around a few times. Maybe they stayed at grandma's. Then they went to friends, they went to aunties, and you know, now they're in the shelter. So, um, you know, there's all of this change, changing schools. Um, so just those regular meetings, the impact is knowing that someone is going to be there every week. Um, and something is gonna be there for them every week. Uh, then you have like, the field trips. To me, the field trips were very important because I know for myself, um, growing up, yes, I had my family supporting me, but it was seeing, um, you know, journalists, especially uh, black journalists, um, at like the camps that I went to, et cetera, that I was exposed to. Um, you know, it's all about exposure and someone um, telling them, well, you can do this too. Let me explain how I did this. Let me explain how I got to this point. Um, and so it gives the girls like just a better view of like, well, I don't have to do this. I could do this. And this person explained to me how I could get to that point. Um, and then um, camping, I believe is very important. And so selling cookies is important too. Um, I think that both of those activities, um, the selling cookies, um, you know, instills this entrepreneurship, this, um, you know, kind of organization. Um, you know, I've seen the girls in action and watched them like figure out like, okay, I'm not the person who should be like really taking the money. I'm not going to do that, but I'm really good at, figuring out like whether or not you're going to get four boxes of Samoas or, you know, whatever. Um, and then with the camping, it's just an experience that I think every girl um, should have in terms of, um, you know, we tend to put girls in these pretty boxes, right? And I'm a pretty girl. I, shout out AK. Um, <laughs> but um, there's nothing like a, uh, seeing the girls just uh, go out and rough it and uh, figure things out. Um, and especially in New York City, you know, um, we live, you know, we're surrounded by concrete um, and it's just really good to just be with nature. Um, and so I, I, I just really believe that, um, all of those things are important and they just have uh, a different impact. Okay, and the final question I have is, do you see yourself continuing with a follow-up book or using this sort of a format to bring awareness to other social topics? Um, yeah, I don't know if I would have um, a, a continuation, uh, you know, another book on Troop 6000 other than, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. I think, you know, there's already, people have already approached me like, oh, you need a graphic novel. Um, we need a kid's version of the book. So, um, you know, you'll probably see some things um, a couple of years down the road. Um, I really thought like the book that I would write would be about politics, but it wasn't. Um, I have a very strong interest. Um, if any of you follow me on Instagram, you know, I cook a lot. Um, and so, you know, I have a strong interest in, um, or writing, um, about food in a way that, um, uh, reflects my heritage and kind of the history of, um, black hospitality and, uh, what that has meant to um, the United States. Um, so, yeah. Sounds good, let me see. I may have one more question to come up. Um, um, I think it's saying going to your Instagram page too. Can't wait to read your book. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, um, 
Uh, Courtney, I think that's all the questions that I have. Okay, thank you, Ms. Right. Kim. We got four minutes to spare. Yeah, that was perfect timing. Thank you all for um, this, and um, I'm really uh, heartened by the, the turnout, and it's so lovely to see so many familiar faces in the chat. I miss you all. Um, when the pandemic is done, I'll hug you. Well, you know, not until there's a vaccine, and then I'll hug you. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to turn it over to one of our Girl Scout team members, Chris Adams, and then Felicia will close us out. Thank and I would like to have a, a moment to say something in closing as well. Okay, um, just real quick, um, I just want to say thank you, Nikita, um, for being here. Um, I really enjoyed that. I'm sure everybody else did too. Um, if you haven't read the book, you still have plenty of time to read the book because in three weeks, we're going to be right back here with Giselle Burgess. Um, she has agreed to come talk to us, um, answer questions about where are they now, um, what's going on with the troop now. She's also running for city council in New York City now, so she's going to um, talk about that. Um, that's going to be three weeks from tonight, um, 6.30 Central, 7.30 Eastern. And we will be in touch with you all by email so that you can register for that event as well. Sounds great. Um, I would just like to say on behalf of Omicron Sigma Mega, thank you to Kentuckiana Girl Scouts for letting us partner with you today and um, uh, meet the author with uh, Sora Nikita Stewart. I will like to let you know that our chapter here locally will also be um, donating a book to the uh, Girl Scout Kentuckiana office here in Bowling Green to keep in your library, as well as donating to our public libraries here in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And um, just want to say thank you, Sora Nikita, for this book. It's very inspiring. Um, makes me want to um, go back to, I remember my days as being a Girl Scout um, brownie and a Girl Scout. So um, I had a wonderful time when I was a Girl Scout and my mom and her sisters were also Girl Scout troop leaders. So um, Girl Scout has been in our family a whole lot. And um, so, you know, I just hope to maybe make a connection with uh, Kentuckiana Girl Scouts. I will be in contact with uh, Felicia on so that we can get yes. the <laughs> to the office and as well as um, talking to her maybe about seeing what uh, Omicron Sigma Omega can do yes. um, for um, the Girl Scouts here locally and also want to give a shout out to um, Sora Nikita's uh, initiating chapter of Epsilon Zeta. We have a lot of Epsilon Zeta members here on this um, Zoom meeting and um, so they're sending their shout outs and their love as well. Thank well, you. yes, thank yeah. you so much. And um, yes, and thank you, my cousin, from the private message. Yes, the Herndon sisters are looking down. And um, yeah, uh, makes me very happy. Well, did we have a wonderful night or what? <laughs> was just awesome 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 thank you so much nikita for um sharing with us tonight your whole story and if you don't stop girl you're gonna make me cry too <laughs> that would not be pretty <laughs> but i just want to thank everyone who was on the call with us all of our girl scout staff for their assistance our technical folks um that made sure that everything went off without a hitch and of course i would be remiss if i did not say thank you to our supervisor Mrs. Janice Kidd, um, who is the Vice President of Membership Strategies for allowing us to pursue this amazing opportunity with Nikita. So thank you, Janice, for all you do to help us be great. Thank you, thank you. And of course, the, all the sorors of Alpha Kappa Alpha and all of the chapters represented tonight, especially Omicron Sigma Omega chapter for being our partner tonight uh, for the presentation. So we will be sending out post-event surveys to everyone and be looking for the information about um, the Zoom event with Troop 6000 leader um, Giselle Burgess. That will be in a few weeks. And I'll copy to that. Yeah, I hope I haven't forgotten anyone and I'm gonna go to church here for just a second. If I have, please, please charge that to my head and not my heart because we really appreciate everyone who came out tonight uh, to join us for this event. And if there's nothing else that claims our attention, um, 
thank you. Good night, and thank you for your presentation, uh, your participation tonight. Thank you, Nikita. Thank you, everyone.